Hello and welcome back. And that's right, today I want to talk about this. We've talked a lot about NAS devices. Dare I say, we've talked a lot about QNAP devices in the last few years. But this is cut from a slightly different cloth. This is the QNAP TS632. X. And if you're a follower of the channel for the last few months, thank you very much, you'll know that when we were in Taipei for the Computex event, when QNAP was showing off some of its newer solutions, this is one that really caught my eye. Now, why is that? On the face of it, it's not actually that exciting. Realistically, it's a 6-bay NAS. It's a 6-bay NAS running on an ARM processor, an AL524 quad core processor there at 2.0 gigahertz per core yes i looked down at my notes but the fact still remains that even though this sounds like a very pedestrian NAS system there's actually a lot going on and in the current kind of price tag of nas devices right now i think it would be fair to say that the majority of six bay nas devices knock around at the moment for about six to seven hundred nicker and you'll be pleased to hear that this trades for about six to seven hundred nicker however this device, although it arrives with an ARM-based processor, rolls out the gate with two 10 GBE connections there on the rear and two 2.5 gigabit Ethernet connections there on the rear. This has got a potential 25 gigabits of network connectivity out the gate and there's a PCIe upgrade slot to add more. Now, that is phenomenally important because that means you're going to open up the floodgates for all of your connected users to this central server system. But there's going to be users out there, myself included, that are wondering, hang on, this has only got six bays. How on earth is this thing ever going to saturate all of those bays? And we'll get onto that later on in the performance section. But for now, let's talk a little bit about what this is, what it isn't, crucially, because some of you may be considering this is not actually suitable for you, and ultimately, whether it deserves your data. So, Again, knocking around for about six nine nine. I've seen it as high as seven hundred and fifty dollars in some places. There is a four bay version of this, the four three two X. Slightly less exciting. It's only got one ten GBE port there on the rear, and it's also worth highlighting that ten gigabit Ethernet that I'm mentioning. It is arriving in SFP or fiber based content, so you will need to get a hold of yourself some fiber uh, fiber channel cabling like this, or you can go ahead and take advantage of fiber or um, fiber to copper based adapters they're allowed to take advantage of traditional copper rj45 connections and if you use the right adapters like this between 25 and 50 dollars you can get 10g copper connections there on top of that a system like this you can probably pair together with something like this switch that we talked about on the channel a while ago it's about 50 to 60 nicker it's got four 2.5 gigabit ethernet ports and two 10 gbe ports and although this switch arrives with those sfp connectors you can use adapters like the one i just mentioned in order to really open things up to traditional copper connections now I talk about this thing being what it is and what it isn't. We've got to talk about what it isn't. That CPU inside being an ARM-based processor means power efficiency coming out of the wazoo. It is results in great 24-7 power consumption numbers being low. But when it comes to more um, aggressive, more graphically manipulative tasks, that CPU is not going to fare well. Now, to put that into perspective, if we're going to talk briefly about power consumption, um, when I had this device fully populated with Seagate 24TB drives, so these are the largest drives currently available in the market right now, so the idea is we're going to try and get as much capacity in this as possible. I only had four of these drives available to me, but I took four of these 24TB drives, popped them in a RAID 5, and the power consumption numbers were as follows. When I had the four hard drives in the RAID 5, it had been completed, fully synchronized, and nothing else going on on the system. It only reported 26.2 watts on average power consumption. Now, when I went with heavy activity on these drives, so that was during the initial uh, RAID building there, but I was also doing heavy read and write, so the parity had to be utilized during synchronization. The CPU at around 80 to 90% at all times. That number went up to 54.55 watts uh, power consumption there, which is pretty high but again for a six bay device going full blisters blazing it's actually not that bad now finally you may be wondering are there ways to sort of play around with that and one of the things we did was fully populate the device with SATA SSDs we put six 500 gig SATA SSDs inside RAID 5 them together and when we have the system guns blazing with two 10G connections active on the device we only saw 
27 to 29 watts power consumption. Again, the storage media change up made all the difference, but that still adds up to a CPU that is not gonna hurt your lucky bill whatsoever. The next thing we need to talk about, aside from that CPU, of course, is memory, because there is some good and bad news about this device. It rocks out with four gig of memory, and it can be upgraded to 16 gig of memory. But the really cool thing, and the noise I made about this during Computex, was this is an ARM-based NAS, that support ECC memory. Error correcting code or error code correction, whichever way you want to go with that one. Ultimately, that means that data going in and out of it does that extra little check some there in the background and repairs any issues or inconsistencies in the data write. Therefore, you're not going to come back to data years from now and it's buggered. However, despite it supporting ECC memory, it doesn't arrive with ECC memory, which really annoys me. I think that's really odd because they're selling a feature on the system that doesn't arrive without out of the box. And it's one thing to say it's 10 GBE ready or something with a PCIe card, but ECC memory, although arguably more expensive than traditional memory, I think they could have sprung for ECC out of the gate on this if it supports it. But still nonetheless, I'm still glad to see that it's on there. Now noise when the system is in operation, as it's an ARM based NAS, you'll be pleased here is actually pretty low, but, Although the system, when it's in idle or in standby, is very, very low, it has to be added that the storage media you, you choose to use will make a difference. This has always been quite a low noise, low impact chassis from QNAP. They've got several different iterations of this across different series, but this device, when I had it populated with those four 24 TB drives, which although very, very large, once you get above 12 to 14 TB, the noise level of these drives, these larger prosumer and enterprise grade drives do creep up. The result was that this generally mid-tier noise system went up to about 35 to 38 dBi during those heavy read and writes I mentioned earlier on there. During idle, it came down a little bit there to about 28, 29, when it was quite simple running. With the SSDs, it went all the way down to 22, but it has to be said at peak noise, it was 35 to 38 dBi. Now, performance on this is going to be a very intriguing one because on the one hand, as mentioned, you've got all manner of bandwidth knocking out a gate on this device and a PCIe slot there at times four speed to throw even more into the mix. So the question is, just how much can this thing output? QNAP's own pages state that it can achieve 2,251 uh, megabytes per second read and 1,082 megabytes per second write. And that was in full population of SATA SSDs in a RAID 0 environment in a perfect user case scenario. And I'm sure that the block sizes there were all tweaked lovely and that synthetic performance was pretty high. But in traditional utilization, we went ahead and did some tests with those five 24 TBC going on wolf drives at a RAID 5 and six SATA SSDs in a RAID 5, and we sort of benchmarked them all together. Um, now, when it came to utilizing the RAID 5 SSDs there, um, a RAID 5 hard drives, I should say, Atto gave us 450 megabytes per second over 400. AJA, on the other hand, and these were all with one gigabyte test files over 10 GBE, gave us 370 over just 298. Crystal Disk went a little higher there at 520 over around 525 and finally when we were performing a windows 10 gbe transfer onto the discs we saw peaks of 375 megabytes per second but that did diminish over time and one of the earliest things we realized with this device with just those hard drive tests there was write performance on this is quite negligible now that's understandable an arm based processor 
it's not phenomenal at right anyway. And also these are hard drives. So six hard drives in this, we're never gonna fully saturate even one of those 10 GBUs without the right tweaking. But what about when we populate the device with SSDs? Well, we fully populated the device with six SATA SSDs in a RAID 5 environment and connected two 10GB connections. Those two 10Gs were fed via the uh, no adapters there, just SFP into SFP uh, onto our Minus 4 and MS01. We had those connected on the two 10G connections, took advantage of SMB multi-channel on both ends, selecting the MTU up to 9000. So therefore, we opened up everything to the hilt. What did we find? Well, when it came to the SATA SSDs, we saw Atto report 1.6 gigabytes per second read and 650 megabytes per second write. AJA was 580 over 850. Crystal Disk Mark, probably the best score so far there, was 2047 megabytes per second read, but just 584 megabytes per second write. Finally, when we went to Windows, we transferred 100, 100 gig of mixed data, and the read performance was 1.4 gigabytes per second at peak, but that ended up settling down to three or 400 megs. And finally, write performance of 538 megabytes per second peak, but that indeed went down to around 219 megabytes per second. Now, had we put them in a RAID zero those numbers would likely have been higher just like qnap's numbers there but i don't think anyone is going to fully populate a six bay nas device in a raid zero regardless of the storage media and yes raid is not a backup and you should have a backup in place but still that seemed very unrealistic to me to put them in a raid zero on this now some of you are going to be wondering wait you're still not fully saturated how could you get more out of this how could you fully saturate it further well for that you're going to need something like this. We've mentioned it before on the channel. This is one of QNAP's QM2 cards. Now, yes, they provide 10 GBE, something this thing's already got in spades, but they also provide M2 NVMe slots. Now, the slot inside this was the Gen 3 times 4 slot, so 4,000 megabytes per second is going to be the maximum throughput for any card going inside this device. So I went ahead and installed uh, a Gen 4 times 4 drive on here, a Seagate uh, Fire CUDA drive, uh, the 530, and when I installed that inside one of these slots, yes, it got downgraded to Gen 3 times 4, but that still would have been more than sufficient. Unfortunately, when we were doing our testing, however, the system really could not stay on top of those M2 NVMEs, and that single M2 NVME only achieved around two, uh, 790 megabytes per second on the system's internal benchmarks. And when we were accessing over 10 GBE, we didn't really see any more than that. And when we were accessing it on 10 GBE, we were using its own native 10 GBE because. Although we didn't have to use that one, we still saw the same result, even though it was on that shared bandwidth all the way through, compared with just using the ones that were already on there. Ultimately, it still means that you open the floodgates to adding even more M2 NVMEs on this, and this is quite a deep chassis as well, so I think it may even support the 4 times M2 NVME card, adding even further storage to this device, adding even further potential to fully saturate those connections on there, but I didn't really have that card in-house to test it. Overall, in summary, I do quite like this. For a 700 nicker give or take NAS, it's pretty damn impressive. It supports the latest hard drives, it supports the latest SSDs, it's got PCI upgradability, and it's got a whole buttload of 10 GBE connectivity there and the ability to scale up even further. 25 gigabit bandwidth out of this for multiple connections and support of SMB multi-channel out the gate is going to make this attractive to simple file processing. Also, on top of that, support of ECC memory is pretty darn good and exceptionally you know, well priced as a package for something that is running on an ARM based processor but adds all of these extra features. I've not really touched on QNAP software, but I'll tell you right now, QTS on this runs as well as to be expected. It doesn't run a lot of the higher for Luton apps, virtualization, Plex transcoding, anything like that, forget it, but you do have access to the full complement of backup apps, uh, uh, QBR Elite as well. You've also got access to a lot of the cloud backup applications there, a lot of the file office applications there. You have access to around 70 to 80% of the QNAP QUTS apps, but you don't have access to the aggressive ones. You don't have access to the ZFS based stuff. They just ZFS and ARM forget about it. Now, as good as all that sounds, we can't all talk about the good things. Number one, the fact it doesn't arrive with ECC memory even though it supports it, 
just annoys me. Just up the price by $25 and give me ECC. Don't tell me it can do it and not give that to me. Secondly, the right numbers consistently were not out, exact, exactly blowing my mind throughout the course of this. Again, I expected that from an arm, but the problem is when you give this amount of storage and this amount of external throughput, and then you find out that your right numbers are gonna be that weak, unless you are completely prepared for it, it's always gonna be disappointing. And lastly, I'm kind of disappointed at two years of manufacturer's warranty on this, when this is clearly a server designed for business. Yes, it's not designed for big business, but very few home users are going to look at this. They're going to be looking at this for file processing, and therefore, I do think the whole business three-year warranty label applies here. I could mention that it doesn't feature M2 NVMe slots, but I'm going to go easy on that one, because it is a six-bay, it's quite well-priced, and you do have the option to upgrade it. But this has been my review of the TS632X. What do you guys think? Hopefully there's a written review uh, link below that you can go for more information about the test that we did and further shots on the design and a little bit more about the ports and connectivity. But other than that, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.